Good afternoon, everybody. It's time for another wonderful afternoon of Chem 170, Organic Chemistry, with your host, me, Dr. White. Do you notice my reflex action when I do like this, my eyes pop open? I don't know why that happens, but it does. But anyways, time for organic chemistry. What we're going to do today is I'm going to go through the alcohols problem set. And then after that, we'll get back to something Dr. White loves a lot, ketones and aldehydes. So thumbs up, people. See the alcohol problem set? Thank you. All right. Now, remember, I'm going to go through one page at a time and Let me. That's better. One page at a time. And let's do this. Remember alcohol, carbon with a hydroxyl group. How do you name it? The IUPAC name, which is the official name. You find the longest chain with the carbon with the hydroxyl group. Name it as an alkane, drop the E, add OL, and if it's a cyclic, not in a ring, use the number what carbon the hydrox group is on. And if it's cyclic, you don't use the number for what carbon the hydrox group is on, but that's always carbon one for numbering other substituents. So if we look at A, three carbons, hydroxyl group on the end, Propane, propanol, one propanol. Now, if we look at B, we have, oh, a ring. Dr. White, Mother Nature loves rings. And six carbon cyclohexane, but it's an alcohol cyclohexanol. No number, because everybody knows this is always going to be one when there's no other functional groups in the ring, which is what's going to happen. Now, let's look at C. I'm going to probably do everyone on this page. And we see, oh, a hydroxyl group on a carbon, alcohol. What's the longest chain? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Five, pentane, drop the E, add OL, pentanol. What carbon is the hydroxyl group on? That always gets priority, which means the lowest number closest to the end of the chain. And it's on carbon two, one, two. So it's two pentanol. And that, oh, look, it's your old friend, the methyl group, and it's on carbon three. So it's three methyl two pentanol. Now, on a ring, the hydroxyl group is always on carbon number one. Hydrox group in a ring, <clears throat> excuse me, five carbons, pentane, ring, cyclopentane, alcohol with a ring cyclopentanol, and then we have on there an isopropyl group and a methyl. This is always one, therefore the isopropyl is two, methyl is three. Now I have the correct IUPAC, three methyl, two isopropyl, cyclopentanol. Who said that five times quickly? No, you don't have to. But if you put two isopropyl and three methyl, cyclopentanol, I would still give you full credit. Now, there are two skills when we come to naming compounds <clears throat> in organic chemistry. And if you look at the uh, module outcomes, and I don't really follow that, I shouldn't say that, but I don't in terms of showing it to you, but I say it every lecture. For nomenclature, fancy word for naming molecules, one skill is, here's the molecule give the official IUPAC name. That's what IUPAC stands for. And the other skill is, here's the structure, draw the molecule. And here, if we look at it, we start from the right, move left. And the question is, draw the condensed structure for the following organic molecule names, which is the second skill in nomenclature. Remember, nomenclature is just a fancy word meaning name. And we start then, oh, OL ending alcohol. If that were E pentane, five carbons, where is the alcohol, the pentane, 
the OL tells you it's an alcohol on carbon too. Now, as I mentioned, Dr. White always counts from the right for alcohols, ketones, aldehyde, well, aldehyde's always I write on the right, and other functional groups. So this would be carbon too, but you could have started on this side and put it on that side. All we've done is rotate the molecule 180 degrees. Ooh, OL ending alcohol, butane, that were E, four carbons, cyclo. This is a ring. Now you call it a square, organic chemists call it a ring. And any one of the carbons, you can put the hydroxyl group. If we go look at C, we have going from the right to left, OLND, alcohol. That were either octane, eight carbons. Keep on going. Where's the hydroxyl group? on carbon two. And then, ooh, methyl CH3, dimines two. What carbons are they on? Three and five, and there you have it. Now, remember, a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group on it is called phenol. And just like we learned for toluene, this is considered a substituent when naming it. And if it's disubstituted, that will, you'll use ortho, meta, and para. And notice I have para isopropyl phenol, phenol, benzene ring, don't forget the double bonds in there or use a circle, and a hydrox group in one. And para means one, four, what's in the four position isopropyl. Now, I will ask you to know common names, be able to draw it, ethyl alcohol, is also the IUPAC name, ethanol, and it's this one here. And any questions on nomenclature? I skipped a few, but let's go here. Any questions on nomenclature? Going once, going twice. All right, let's move on. Now, when I'm teaching you new functional groups, there are a couple things you should know. One is general knowledge, like in test one, how many bonds to carbon? Or where do you find these in the real world? And in the case of alcohol, I think I've already mentioned, you can find it. Did anybody drive by a gas station or go into a gas station, happen to see the placard? by the pumps that says this gasoline contains up to 10% ethanol. And do you know that's the IUPAC name for an alcohol with two carbons? Or did you happen to be in a supermarket or a big box store or you have it at home and pick up a bottle of rubbing alcohol, which contains isopropyl alcohol? Guess what? That's an alcohol. Or do you happen, if you're old enough, happen to be in a liquor store or a supermarket that sells liquor and see the good stuff like vodka or Canadian club. My father loved Canadian club. And to this day, I still do too. He used to give me some when I was young. But anyways, and my grandfather liked it too. And he used to give me some when I was young too. See what happened to me? Anyways, remember things like that. I think I have a question. I think someone was talking to someone else, but anyways, uh, let's get back to the problem set. And the third thing you should know is reactions of this functional group, how to make them, and then how to react the functional group, because that's the real fun part of organic chemistry, at least for Dr. White. So if we look at 3A and B, we've already had this on test number one, but this is one reaction I can put on more than one test. And that is, what's the organic product or products are following? And if we have this, what do we have? Ooh, double bond acid and water. Remember, water is HOH. You break the pi bond. One carbon gets H, the other gets OH. And it follows Markov the cost rule. The carbon to double bond with the most hydrogens gets the hydrogen. The other carbon gets the hydroxyl. Or as I learned, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Talking about hydrogens now. 
And if you look at a double bond, this has two hydrogens, this has one, this is a larger number, hydrogen will go there, hydroxyl will go there. Do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. So I have four across, that gets the hydrogen, that gets the hydroxyl. And on a ring, remember, Dr. White, Mother Nature, love rings, students don't. And here, double bond, H plus and water, S and water, same general reaction. You break the pi bond, you don't break carbon, carbon single bonds, but now, oh no, I've got to count. I got to remember there's four bonds to carbon. Hold on, let me fix my finger, four bonds to carbon. And you got to count, this has four bonds to it, so four minus four, zero hydrogens. This has three bonds to it. Remember, we don't show a hydrogen on a ring, so it has one, which has more hydrogens here. Hydrogen will go here to that carbon. Hydroxyl group will go to that one, and you get this alcohol. Remember, if these are switched, if you put CH3 here, OH there, it's the same product. You just rotate them all, go 180 degrees. And I have some more here. And now let's look at the following. Now here, what do we have? We have an alcohol reacting with acid. And this little triangle here means high heat, like the little flame on top of a Bunsen burner. And I don't always, but sometimes I'll even put the temperature. And 180 degrees C in organic chemistry, that's high heat for a reaction. And this is a dehydration dehydration, loss of water. And what happens is you lose the OH, hydroxyl group on the alcohol, and adjacent carbon next to it, hydrogen, and you form a double bond and it follows Zaysa's rule. Now in the two examples here, guess what? I didn't give you a chance to use Zaysa's rule because this is the only carbon that's adjacent with hydrogens, and that's one. And this one, there's no hydrogens, so this is the only one and you'll get that. But let's look at the following. How do you do Zaysef's rule? Now, again, acid and water, and you lose hydrox group and adjacent carbon with the hydrogen, water, and between those two carbons, you find you form a double bond. Now, in this case, here's the hydroxyl group, and here's the hydrogen. I'll call it A. This one will give the same answer, which would have been A also, which is why I didn't put one down there. And then over here, if I lose, or first of all, if I lose hydrogen there, hydrox group, between these two carbons, I'll form the double bond. All the rest of the carbons come along for the ride. And this is the molecule I formed, the alkene. Now, if I lose the hydrogen from B and the hydroxyl group, between this carbon and this carbon, I will form the double bond. Now, how does Zaysef's rule work? You count and listen carefully. The carbon atoms, not all the atom carbons, just the carbon atom directly bonded to the carbons that are double bond. And in carbon, uh, structure A, by the way, you can't see it because it's part of it went to the circle, that's the three. This one has this carbon and this carbon. You don't count this one because that's not directly bonded. So in A, we have two carbon atoms directly bonded to the carbon atoms of the double bond. In B, let's count one, two, three. And now, which is the greater number? And time's up. Hopefully, I'll pick three. And Zaysa's rule says that's the one you get the one with the more carbon atoms directly bonded to it. Now, in real life, they have said it differently, but Dr. White's changed, not changed it, simplified it so it's easier for you. Shh, don't tell anybody I'm being nice. Next couple, G and H, what do we have here? Again, I can't stress this enough, so I'm gonna stress it more. When you're doing organic chemistry reactions, look for what's different. Look for what's not carbon, look for what's not hydrogen, 
look for what's not a carbon carbon single bond. Why? Because that's where all the fun happens. And you should always get it zero in right there. Actually, that's where all the action always happens. And that's what I do when I look at a molecule, look for what's different. So if we come over here, ooh, hydrox group on a carbon, alcohol, this one's the same thing. It's a secondary alcohol. What's O in a bracket? Oxidizing agent. That means you lose this hydrogen and this hydrogen form a carbon oxygen double bond, which you learned in the chapter I'll cover later today is a ketone because they're two R groups. So here you break carbon, carbon single bonds, no. So I have a ring, I still have that ring and I have double bond to oxygen, so lost the hydrogen. Same thing here. By the way, you can put this oxygen going down most of the time, unless I have a space constraint, I'll do it up. But if you do it down, carbon double bond to oxygen, that's fine. Now, if we have a primary alcohol, then same thing happens. You lose, you oxidize it, and that's what this means, oxidizing agent. And a later chapter, I'll tell you how sometimes you don't want this to happen, but that's later down the road. Here we have a alcohol, it's a primary alcohol, one R group on there. I'll never ask on a test what's primary, secondary, tertiary, but I did teach you that because I used that terminology in class. And here we have a hydrogen here, hydrogen there, oxidize it. You lose one of each, form a carbon oxygen double bond. As you learn, it's an aldehyde. Do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. So I have four here, end up with four. The carbon with the hydroxyl group is the carbon that's double bond to oxygen and still has a hydrogen. Remember, this is two bonds, even though it's to oxygen. So let's look at this carbon. One, two, three bonds to it. And the fourth one is hydrogen. Next one is a fun reaction, even though SOCl2, thionyl chloride, is a very hazardous chemical to work with. I've worked with it in the lab when I was in grad school. And on a day like today, if you open the bottle of thionyl chloride, there's enough moisture in the air from the melting snow and whatever, that you'll see white smoke come out of there. That's the thionyl chloride vapor reacting with, guess what, the water. And a lot of times what you'll do is have a gas flow of argon to keep the moisture away. But it's one of those chemicals that separate chem uh, people who should be chemists and people who aren't gonna be chemists. And thionyl chloride, is reacting with what? What's different in alcohol? Thionyl chloride, alcohol. You replace the hydroxyl group with a chlorine and it's on the carbon that had the hydroxyl group will be the carbon with the chlorine. So here, this was simple, methyl chloride. We come over here. Oh, look, Dr. White's doing the favorite trick of an organic chemistry instructors on a test, put a big scary molecule. Ooh, that's big and scary. No, it's not. If you know what to look for, functional group, what's different? This is this, this general reaction, alcohol, thionyl chloride. This is my R group. It stays this, excuse me, stays the same. I replaced the hydroxyl group with the chlorine. And I gave you another one. And where's M? Oh, it disappeared. It's the next page. All right. Let's look at this reaction or N, and what do we have? Here I have big scary molecule, but no, look for what's different. Oxygen with a hydrogen on a carbon, alcohol. What am I reacting with? HCl. Remember, X is used for the halogens, chlorine, bromine, iodine. And in this reaction, you replace the hydroxyl group with the halogen on the carbon that had the hydroxyl group. So this all comes along for the ride. It's still there. The carbon with the hydrox group is now the carbon with the chlorine. And same thing here, alcohol. Now I've changed X, HX, is now bromine is X. And I placed the hydrox group 
with a bromate. And once more for overkill. Ooh, I thought of something. Let's have some fun. So far, Dr. White's been having all the fun. And that's not right. And what molecule would you react with HI to make the molecule I just drew? You have some fun. And on test number two, unlike test one, where I only had one synthesis problem, synthesis meaning how to make, on test two, I historically do three, which means this weekend I better write it. And also, once you're done with this, I have repeat announcement I made last week. When you're done, give me a thumbs up. Oh, wait, wait. Dr. White has an idea. Let's try something. All right, great moments in Chem 170. First time I ever tried this. Let's see if it works. I'm going to start doing this. Are you done? Answer the polling question. Now, I wonder, once you answer the polling question, can you back go back and change your mind? Whoever did no, see if you can change it to yes. Or better yet. Well, I guess not. No, we can't. Well, mostly are done. So I'll see, see if we can use that or not. It's an experiment. Oh, one of the things you'll learn in or if you're an organic chemist usually about 80, 90% of the experiments you do to make new stuff don't work. And you got to learn rejection and how to deal with it. All right, let's get back to our problem. And Joshua, thank you for the feedback. All right, we're trying to find out how to make this. What's different? Well, first of all, I'll put that hydrogen in. Somebody should have caught it. Luckily, I did. But anyways, Ooh, an iodine on a carbon, alkyl halide, where X can be bromine, chlorine, or in this case, iodine. And it's here too. So we have HX, what do we react? An alcohol. And therefore, do we break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. So we end up with one, two, three, four cross, plus the two methyls. So I better start with one, two, three, four across. And my two methyls, this thing, six months ago, if I said two methyls, you wouldn't know what I was talking about. Now you do. And the carbon with the halogen is the carbon with the hydroxyl group, which is this one right here, which is now this one right here. And that's how you do synthesis.
Now, one more I'd like to do. Let me just check something. I should say that I'd like you to do. And I'm going to help you out. And why don't you try this one? What would be the product or products for the following reaction? And don't forget, this follows a rule. Oh, I'm going to try it again. I think I can relaunch polls. This is probably one of the more challenging reactions you'll learn this semester. I have faith in you. when you're done, give me a thumbs up or better yet, I see people still pondering it. So, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Let's try this once more and see how it goes. And if you're done, Check out the poll, unless you're driving in a car. I actually had last semester at the other school, one student who was listening to me while going to work and would watch the videos. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do this. All right, how do we do this? We look at this, here's what's different. Hydrox group on a carbon and adjacent carbon with hydrogens. Which are the adjacent carbons, A or B? So there are two possible, but only one is predicted by Zaysa's rule. Well, how do we do that? We look at this carbon. If I lose the hydrox group and the hydrogen on A, what I will get is a double bond between those two carbons, and my methyl groups are still coming along for the ride, because you know you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. Now, what if I lose this carbon on B? This carbon has a hydrogen, and I lose my hydrox group and a hydrogen there. Then I'll, between this carbon and carbon B, I'll form a double bond, and my methyl groups are still there, because you don't break carbon, carbon, single bond. So now which one is favored by Zaysa's rule? Well, what you have to do is look at how many carbon atoms are bonded to the carbons of the double bond. If we look up in A, I have one. Remember, this is carbon atoms directly bonded. Two. So I have two carbon atoms. Now, if I look at B, I have one, two, and students forget this one, three, because those are bonded to the carbons of the double bond. So this one has three, which is the greater answer, eh? larger number. 
and the answer is three. So the correct answer is B, and that's how you use ASOS rule. I'll leave it up there for a second in case there are two, in case you're writing this down. And don't forget, you can also watch the video on Dr. White's world famous, not really, YouTube CHM 170, CHEM 170 YouTube channel. And by the way, I'm glad to see some of you are looking and it's helping you out. All right, any questions on this before I leave? alcohol problem set. And the answer is no. So let me do something that makes clean up a little here. All right, let's get back to ketones and aldehydes. Remember, we've already done nomenclature, but just to remind you, oops, wrong color. Right color. This is an aldehyde. This is a ketone. And both have, which you should know, the carbonyl group. And carbonyl group, you should know, is carbon double bond to oxygen. And because of the difference in electronegativity, which I talked about on Monday, the carbonyl carbon, this carbon is slightly positive. Delta means slightly, the oxygen is slightly negative. And because of that, it's key factor in a lot of the chemistry of ketones and aldehydes is what we call nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl nucleopositive file loving. And if I'm a nucleophile, I'm looking for anything with a positive charge. And where do I find it? That carbon. As you see there, it's slightly positive. Let me magnify that. It's slightly positive. And a nucleophile is always on the lookout for anything positive. And as I pointed out, the nucleophile will, organic chemists are very violent, attack and bond to that and open up the pi bond and the electrons from there go to the oxygen. Another way of showing it is if you have a nucleophile NH plus NU minus, the H goes on the oxygen, the nucleophile attacks the carbonyl carbon. And again, ooh, look at, I use pretty pictures there. My software does it. This lowercase delta, slight negative charge on oxygen, slight positive charge on carbon. All right, can I have everybody's attention? Everybody, take a deep breath, let it out. Take a deep breath, let it out. Are you all nice and relaxed? That's good. Stay that way. Now, I should warn you, take a deep breath, let it out. The next four reactions are some of the most challenging to students this semester. Take a deep breath, let it out, stay relaxed. With a little practice, you'll get them. But at first you're saying, oh my goodness, what's going on? Well. It's dealing with nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon. Then once you make something, how you, I guess, unmake it or react it further. Why are these important? 
because the next two reactions are how Mother Nature uses to make carbohydrates. And I'll teach you more about that later when we get into carbohydrates specifically, but not now. I'll do it with aldehydes and ketones. And the two reactions after that is how in your stomach, Mother Nature has provided the chemistry to break down carbohydrates for things that your body can use for whatever your body uses it for. Don't forget the last biology I took was high school year freshman, freshman year high school. And not that there's anything wrong with biology, but even then I knew I was gonna be a chemist and I took chemistry after that. All right, um, let's go to that. All right, here's the first reaction. And the way I have on the slide, let me teach you something that I mentioned earlier. When our prime and our double prime, I see someone has a question. All right, I see others are, I'll get back to you. Uh, but anyways, uh, when our prime is carbons, our double prime, that's a ketone. When our prime is a hydrogen and our double prime are carbons, that's a aldehyde. So when our prime equals hydrogen, we're talking about aldehydes. And when our prime is carbons and hydrogens, we're talking about a ketone. So by writing it this way, I'm saying both aldehydes and ketones undergo the same reaction and they do. So if I take an aldehyde and ketone and react, now we're getting into good stuff because we're reacting with other organic molecules and alcohol. And I use, and this is acid catalyst. What happens? This attacks the carbonyl carbon, opens it up. The H goes to the oxygen, this OR goes on the carbonyl carbon. Now what's attached to it, our primer H, our double prime are still there because keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon because that's where the fun happens. You break the pi bond, this opens up to that, and you have OR from the alcohol on the carbon. That was my carbonyl carbon. Now, I will never ask on a test, but other classes might bring this up. When you start with an aldehyde, our prime is H, this new molecule you made, it's called the hemiacetal. When you start with a ketone, our prime is al alcohol or cycloalkyl, carbons and hydrogen, you get a hemiketal. Yes, there are nomenclature for those, but I'm not going to go into that in this class. But I will do the chemistry. So let's go look at some reactions. So if we look at the following reaction, the question is what's the product or products are following? Well, first of all, identify what functional groups you're dealing with, otherwise known as look for what's different. Ooh, carbonyl, carbons here, carbons here, that's a ketone. Now our prime is carbons, but if it was hydrogen, it would, would have been an aldehyde, it's not. Then carbon, carbon, car hydroxyl group on a carbon, alcohol. 
and I have acid catalyst, what do I get? Keep your eye on the carbonyl. What's attached to that are double prime and R prime, or if it was a hydrogen, hydrogen, is still attached there. It comes along for the ride. Now, what happens? You open up the pi bond of the carbonyl, the hydrogen from this goes there, and this part goes here. Now, let's take a look at this. And by the way, on the ketone, you can call one R prime, the other R double prime, doesn't matter. Right now, I'll call that R prime. And this R double prime and the carbons on the alcohol, I'll call R. So you have this carbon right here, which becomes this carbon, which is this carbon. What's attached to it, our prime, CH2, CH3, is still there. And our double prime, CH3, is still there. I open it up to an alcohol. It's not really an alcohol. And I have an oxygen. One of the things, the carbon with the hydroxyl group is the carbon in R that this oxygen is bonded to, which is the end of three. So there we go. And that's the product. As I say, Mother Nature uses this to form carbohydrates such as the starches. And if you had anything good for lunch, which I'm staying away from because I got to lose my COVID-19 weight gain. <laughs> I got to start on that. Uh, but anyways, so I'm not. But if you had potato chips, one of Dr. White's favorites, and she has carbohydrates, Mother Nature used this reaction to make those carbohydrates and that awfully bad thing, but really good thing, plays sour cream and onion potato chips. All right. Why don't you try one? And the question is, what's the organic product or products for the following? Have fun. Oops. Covered it all for you. Now it's there. Hope those of you who stayed late on Monday, hopefully you all enjoyed the picture I shared with you and my three girls for long gone, but never forgotten. Misty, Janie, and Wendy, my sister's sheep dogs. I have to show you a picture of Rory, who was my sister's border collie. Uh, I have to find one. Uh, I don't think I have one with him. I just still on me, just alone. But he was such a pretty dog and uh, also obedience trained that he was on the cover for a number of years of one of the major dog foods. They actually call them in to do photo shoots. All right, let's try this poll thing one more time. If you're done, click on yes. All right, let's try another experiment. And let's try it again. If you're done, click on yes. If not, click on no. All right, I think everybody's just about done. So, Let's do it. All right, now 
remember when you're doing an organic chemical reaction, look at the different reactants. Remember, these are the reactants or starting materials and look for what's different. It's another way of saying, look for the functional group. Ooh, carbonyl with an oxygen. What do we have on this carbonyl? Carbon double bond oxygen. We have a hydrogen, but it could have been R prime. And we have methyl here, which I'll call R double prime. What's different here? Carbon, carbon. Ooh, hydroxy group on a carbon. That's an alcohol. And notice we have H plus, which means acid catalyst. Keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. What's attached to it? Our prime, double prime, our prime, or it could have been hydrogen. You also have, you break the pi bond, have the OH, and from the alcohol, OR. So I can say, here's my R prime H, my R double prime, and here, my R group. Now, keep your eye on this carbon, which is this carbon, which I'll write over here, because I'm running out of room. That happens on a whiteboard too, I'll do this. Put that carbon, what's attached to it, our prime and our double prime, in this case H and methyl are still there. I'll have my hydroxyl group. I'll have my oxygen, this one right there. And then what's my R group? Ethyl. And I'm done. And that's how you do it. And if I look at the clock, it's time for our break. So I'm going to take five minute break like I would if we were in class. I can go stretch because I've been sitting all this time. And I'll see you at 1.55.
Thomas, I apologize if you hyperventilated. Do you have a brown paper bag? Isn't that what they used to do? People go like this if they're hyperventilating? Or is that just in the movies? I don't know. I never had that problem, thank goodness. But I remember I remember when I was a kid at the boy at the uh, at the neighborhood boys club at uh by Western and Irving uh oh. in Chicago. And uh <laughs> I was playing ping pong. And, and and I was holding my breath, and woo, I went. Really? So you're a North Side Chicagoan? Oh yeah, Roosevelt High School, Kedzie and Irving, right right next to the Commodore Theater. All right. Until I think it was fourth grade, we lived on Campbell, right by uh, Western and Lincoln. Or sure. No, not Western Lincoln. Foster and Western. Okay. You remember the beefy 19 on Western by there? Beefy. It was a takeout joint? No. Uh, if you lived in the neighborhood, that was a real yeah. famous place. Uh, did you ever go to the Riviera Theater? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And Jeff, yep. for you, it would be a trip. Did you ever go to the Nordtown on Western by Devon. Yeah, right across from Rose Hill Cemetery. Uh, a little yeah. further down from that. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Was, yeah. Uh, I call it downtown Devon. When it was saw, a big shopping area. Saw Star Wars there. Really? Wow. 77. That's cool. All right. I better get back to work. I'm running a minute late. All right. Quick commercial, or not commercial, quick. Uh, message from the management me dr white don't forget on monday and wednesday nights and today's wednesday so i'll have one i have my office hour and actually it's more than an hour but hour and 50 minutes and stop by us on zoom from 6 to 7 15 and if you have any questions come by and ask because i'll help you as you know my class is always true there's no such thing as a dumb question and on Monday night, I had one of your colleagues stop by, and hopefully I was able to help the colleague. And always feel free to do that. By the way, if you can't make it to my office hours and you do need help, luckily, since we now have Zoom, let me know and I'll see if we can, I can find some time to meet you on Zoom meeting that I'll set up special to help you out because I'm here to help you learn organic chemistry. And that's what I think my job should be, and I do it. All right, let's do another one of those because those are challenging reactions we're doing. Now, one of the things that I don't have time to do, which is sad, but we only have one semester. This was a two semester. I'd be showing you this and also putting it on a test, but there's a mechanism. Mechanisms are showing step-by-step step what happens in every reaction. And for every reaction, I'll show you this semester, Dr. White knows the mechanisms. I should point out, when I was in grad school, my PhD advisor, the research group I was in, Dr. Rusher, I will forever, ever be grateful to how he helped build the most strongest foundation in me of organic chemistry. But anyways, he used to always beat on our intus. You should understand the mechanism, what's happening in a reaction. That way you can change it. And he was right. I did do that a number of times by understanding the mechanism and other organic chemists didn't help me do things. But I can't in this class, so, but we still practice it and you'll get the general idea.
That should be a three. Let me clean it up. And have fun. What would be the organic product or products for the following? One thing I should mention on this reaction and the next three, because they are so challenging, I will never put a synthesis problem on this one or the next three on a test or on my final. I'll say that again. This reaction, the next three I'll show you after this, I will never ever on my test or final put a synthesis problem. But this I will give the organic product or product three points each. Oh, I'll have extra credit problems on the final that I don't have to put this one in because it's still too challenging. Even the extra credit problems I do, I like to make it so they're doable. Otherwise, that's not fair. That's not who I am. That's a good idea, but I'll stick to the ones I already have. I I asked two questions. First one, if you like me asking, are you done? Give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up now, if you like that way. If you like me doing the polls, give me the clap your hands right now. Uh oh, it's equally divided. Oh no. Oh, you don't have a mo. Well, you can just write it out. You don't have emoji. Uh, that's an extra five dollars per month. No, I'm just kidding. All right. I think everybody's done by now, but I'll try doing both, and we'll switch back and forth because there's about a 50-50 split. All right, let's do this. Let's get back to chemis organic chemistry. Question is, what's the organic product or pro products for the following? And we look at those starting materials and say, what's different? Another way is saying, what functional group? Ooh, look for what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, what's not a carbon-carbon single bond. And that's where the fun is. Ooh, oxygen double bond to carbon, carbonyl, carbon double bond to oxygen. Got carbons here and here. I'll call our prime and our double prime. Just so happens in this example, they're the same, but our prime could have been a hydrogen. If it was, this would be an aldehyde. If it's carbons like this is, it's a ketone. What am I reacting with? Carbon, ooh, oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon, alcohol. Acid catalyst, the H plus right here. And what do you get? Keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon because that's where the fun is. Remember, Dr. White's a carbonyl carbon synthetic organic chemist. So I love carbonyl carbons, really do. So does Mother Nature. And what's attached to that carbon is still attached. Then this opens up the hydroxyl group and oxygen on the same carbon. And the oxygen here has this R group. And 
the carbon with the hydroxyl group here is the carbon this oxygen right here is bonded to. So let's look at our example. We'll call this our prime. This our double prime, as you can see right here. The carbon on the hydroxyl group, I'll call R. And now I'll start with this carbon, which becomes this carbon. And I'll move up here where I have more room. And what's attached to it, our prime methyl, our double prime methyl is still attached to it. Next, I'll have my hydroxyl group, as you see here, and then oxygen, which you see there. What's my R? Three carbons. The carbon with the hydroxyl group, in this case, the center one, will be the carbon attached to the oxygen. And I know there are four bonds to carbon, so I can put in my hydrogen, and that's the molecule you have. And these are useful in synthesis, but I'll teach you later in the semester. This reaction will very, very much more complex starting materials to make carbohydrates. And that's when Mother Nature shows everybody, look what a great organic chemist I am. And she is. All right. Any question on that reaction? Let's move on. Now, if you notice on the reaction I just did, we have one molecule or mole of the aldehyde or ketone and reacting with one molar molecule. Remember the coefficient when there's none is the number one molecule or mole Remember, moles is the county unit of chemist of alcohol. Well, it turns out you can also do the reaction with two molecules or moles of alcohol. And here again, I have it written this way. Let me write it. Have a ketone, R, R double prime. If R prime is hydrogen, I have an aldehyde. And now, I'm reacting with not one, but two molecules or moles of an alcohol and acid catalyst. And here, keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. What's attached to it initially in terms of carbon and hydrogen is still attached to it. And this opens up now to our oxygens and each one has the R group on it from the alcohol. And this is called, when you start with an aldehyde, R prime is H, this is called an acetal. When R prime is carbons, it's a ketal. And acetals make up, I'm gonna give it away now, coming attraction. Those of you who are into nutrition or just learning about the great food groups, acetals are mainly what are carbohydrates like starches are made up of. We'll get to that later and it'll be exciting. So when you have, and you got to now look at the reaction to make sure you look at the coefficient, the number in front, when you have an aldehyde or ketone reacting with now two moles of an alcohol and acid catalyst, you form the acetal or ketal. Instead of one of these being H, it's now also an R group. And now let's look at this general reaction or this reaction. What would be the product or products? 
Remember, learning how to do this with general reactions is how organic chemists make the different molecules we use in our daily life to do everything from wash your clothes, soften it, uh, your makeup, your nail polish, all of them use these types of general reactions you'll be learning this semester. So if we look at the first uh, reactant, carbonyl, that's different. It's got a hydrogen. I call that our primer H. And it's got these carbons, one of them. I'll call that our double prime. And this is an aldehyde. It could have been a ketone. Next. Ooh, number two, that's unusual. Carbon, carbon hydroxyl group. Ah, that's an alcohol. An acid catalyst. And what do you get? Keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. What's attached to it in terms of carbon and hydrogen is still attached to it. Next, you get the pi bond of the oxygen opens up and you have two oxygens and each one gets the R group carbons from the alcohol. So if I look here, here's my carbonyl carbon. I'm gonna write this carbon right here. What's attached to it, R prime, in this case is hydrogen, R double prime methyl. And I'll have two oxygens. And then my R group, in this case, and I didn't do this, I should have. This is R prime. This is R double prime. This is R is ethyl. And that's the molecule you get. And as I've told you already a number of times, and this is another time I'll tell you, the question you should be asking is, why am I learning this stuff? Well, the obvious answer is you want to get a good grade in my class. If someone told you to get in a program or a school, you need to get a good grade in organic chemistry. But why learn this really? Well, this reaction Mother Nature uses to make the starches in our life. Now, if you like the good stuff like Lay's potato chips or French fries, I shouldn't have thought of that. But anyways, or pizza crust. This is a reaction Mother Nature uses to make those starches. All right, and it's time for you to try one. And again, I'll never ask a synthesis on this reaction. And why don't you try this one for your fun and enjoyment on this sunny afternoon. I looked out my window while we were on break, my front uh, living room window. And I saw all my evergreen bushes are now free of snow, which is a good thing. I got some big ones out there. And I also saw the big mountains of snow by my and my other neighbor's driveways, which were about five, six feet high, are now melting at only about two feet high. That's a good thing. And Tom, the answer is, of course, I'm an organic chemist. And as I might have mentioned in the past, uh, I love organic chemistry and chemistry. My older sister hates it with a passion. <laughs> but yes, I am a practicing organic chemist. I practice what I preach. <laughs> and later on, so I think we'll get to it today, I'll show you how your stomach and my stomach breaks down carbohydrates, even though we'll learn it in detail later on.
Let's try Napoleon once more because there was about a 50-50 split. While you're doing that, I'm going to have some water. All right, it looks like that worked. Even though I personally like the thumbs up thing myself, but that's my personal opinion. But I'll do both, whatever helps you. All right, let's look at this. How do you determine what's the organic product or product for the following? You look at the starting materials and say what's different, what functional group. Ooh, and look for what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, what's not a carbon, carbon single bond, oxygen, double bond to carbon, carbonyl. It's got a hydrogen, but we call that R prime. It's got carbons here. I'll call that R double prime. And I'll go to the next thing, carbon hydro. Ooh, I see the number two. And it's an alcohol. I have acid catalyst. And I know, keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. That's where the fun is. And what's attached to it, hydrogen or carbons, is still attached to it. And then this opens up when you have two molecules or moles of an alcohol to an acetal or ketal. Now, this is our double prime. Oops. This is our, I'll write my carbonyl carbon, this one right here, which becomes this carbon right here. What's attached to it? Our prime, which is a hydrogen, our double prime ethyl group, two carbons, is still attached to it. Opens up to two oxygens, and on each oxygen here, we have R, in that case, it's methyl. And that's how you do, oh, let's do one more. Dr. White's really having a good time. And that's how you do it. And why don't you try this one more for our fun and enjoyment on this sunny afternoon. Yeah, I was just looking at the date. Remember, be careful around the 15th of March. For those of you who read, uh, Julius Caesar in high school, I did, et tu brute. The Ides of March is when Julius Caesar got killed, which is the 15th. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. I'll switch between the two. So both groups can be happy in my class. Or both groups can be upset with me. I see some thumbs up. All right, I think everybody's done. Hold on. Is everybody done? I think so. Let's do it. All right. Ooh, this is a little different. What do we have here? Look for what's different. Oxygen to carbon. And I've got carbons here and here. And this is a cyclic ketone. It just so happens in a ring, R and R prime are connect together. So this is a ketone, could have been an aldehyde, but it's not. Then what's different here? Ooh, the number two. And carbon, carbon, hydroxyl group, and alcohol. I have two molecules or moles, acid catalyst. What happens? Keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. 
what's attached to it, our primer hydrogen plus the carbons here are still attached to it. It opens up to two oxygens and each oxygen has the R group carbons and hydrogens from the alcohol. Well, this whole ring is R prime, double prime and R prime. Here's this carbon. So what's attached to it is still attached to it. So I'm gonna have this ring. And there's my carbon, that's this carbon here. Now on that carbon, I'll have two oxygens. And what's my R from the alcohol ethyl? And the same thing here. And that's how you do this reaction. And like I said, we'll come back to it when we get into carbohydrates. We're getting some of these things in this class. Now, once you have these two molecules, what can you do with it? Well, you can react it with acid and water. So if I have a hemiacetal or hemiketal, which we made earlier from the reaction of an aldehyde or ketone with one mole of alcohol, of uh, alcohol and acid, what happens when you react it with acid and water? Now, before I go forward and show you, I want to ask a question of all of you. All right, right now in my office, or better yet, where you are at, either at home, at work, or wherever, what if you needed to find acid and water real quick, like right now? Where would you find it? Anybody know? Oh, you're being shy. So I'll tell you, in your stomach, in your stomach, you have acid and water. Water. And one of the miracles of science, I always, of life, still to this day astounds me is we all have cells in our body that may synthesize hydrochloric acid as another form of H. And that helps break down your food. When we get into the main food groups, carbohydrates, fats, and oils, and proteins, I'll show you the exact chemistry. But the next two reactions are the chemistry Mother Nature provided for us in our stomach to break down the three major food groups. Actually, there are more, you know, about the real major ones, you know, alcohol, pizza, potato chips, and whatever, maybe hamburgers or hot dogs. But <laughs> I lemon would have done it, but it's not strong enough, Martin. That's a good answer, though. I mean, really strong acid. So let's go back here, and we'll learn later on certain carbohydrates have this structure. If you had acid and water, which you can find in your stomach, what happens is keep your eye. And now here's important: look for this molecule the hemiacetal or hemiketal, what's different? And this is very rare in organic chemistry. When you have a carbon with two oxygens bonded directly to that one carbon, two oxygens, in this case, one of the oxygen has R, the other has H. And what you get back is the ketone or aldehyde you would have used to make that compound plus the alcohol you would have used to make that. So essentially, you're reversing the reaction we use to make the hemiacetal or hemiketal. And that's how it is. Now, the carbon in OR with the oxygen is the carbon with the hydroxyl group in your alcohol. I'll say that again. The carbon with the, o, uh, with the oxygen in OR of your hemiacetal or hemiketal is the carbon and R with the hydroxyl group. Now, what's attached to this carbon with two oxygens becomes this, what's attached to the ketone or aldehyde. 
you get in this reaction. When R prime is H, it's an aldehyde. When R prime is carbons, it's a ketone. So let's have some fun with this reaction. Remember, these are the more challenging reactions I'll teach you this semester. And the question is, what's the organic product or products for the following? And you look, what's different in this molecule? Ooh, one, no, two oxygens bonded to the same carbon. That's different. Only happens in two cases in all of organic chemistry. And what's attached to that carbon? Well, I have OH, oxygen. I have carbons here, which I'll call R. And I have to the carbon with the two oxygens, a hydrogen, which could have been our prime, but I'll call H. And then carbon sphere, I'll call our double prime. And what happens when you react this with acid and water? And I should point out, I could have also written it this way. Either way is identical. And what do you get? Keep your eye on the carbon with the two oxygens. What's attached to that in terms of carbons or hydrogens is there. And you get a ketone or aldehyde you would have used to make this molecule. And then this R here is the alcohol you would have used to react with a ketone or aldehyde to make the starting material. And I'll never ask you synthesis on that, but it's still good to understand where this came from. So keep your eye on the carbon with the two oxygens. This one, it becomes this carbon right here, the carbonyl carbon. What's attached to it, our prime, in this case hydrogen, our double prime, two carbons, is still attached to it. Then we're making not one, but two products. And the alcohol are right up here, three carbons. Which carbon has the oxygen? The end one. So I have uh, three carbons. And the end one will have the alcohol. And I know they're four bonds to carbon. And that's my product. I'll hold off while everybody's copying this down and gets this out of the way so you can see it. Ooh, that reminds me, important announcement from me, the management, and that is on Monday. Usually we do on Wednesdays, but I'll just do it on Monday. I will go through the ethers and epoxides problem set. I would highly recommend you do it before I do. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. All right, I forgot which I did. Let's do a thumbs up. Well, I don't think you're done yet, so I'll be quiet. Or 
or did I forget to give you your own problem? Guess what? I did because I was waiting for everybody to copy it. So let's do one for you. And why don't you try this one for your fun and enjoyment on this sunny afternoon. I don't know about you, but I sure don't miss going out and spending quality time with my driveway, a shovel, or my snowblower. I don't miss that one bit. But then again, in about a couple of weeks, maybe a little longer, I'll get to spend quality time with my lawn and lawnmower. And also my leaf blower to clean off both sidewalks after I mow my lawn if I don't catch the grass. And uh, all the joys of home ownership. I think everybody just about done. Let's do the thumbs up today for this one. Thumbs up. All right, I think everybody's done. So let's do it. Look at this reaction. Look at the starting material. What's different? What's not carbon? What's not high? Ooh, one, no, two oxygens, the same carbon. There's only two places in all organic chemistry, and this is one of them. What do I have here? Carbon, hydroxyl group, oxygen, what's on the oxygen? Carbons, I'll call that R. What's attached to that carbon? Methyl, I'll call that R prime. Isopropyl, I'll call that R double prime. Now, this could have been hydrogen, but it's not. And when I react it with acid and water, what happens? Keep your eye on this carbon with two oxygens. What's attached to it carbon hydrogen wise is still attached to it. And it's double bonded to keep to an oxygen. So you get the ketone or aldehyde you would have used to make this, plus the R group on this oxygen becomes an alcohol. And if we look up here, keep your eye on this carbon, which becomes this carbon right here. Double bond to oxygen, what's our methyl, our prime methyl? What's our double prime? Isopropyl, remember you don't break carbon, carbon single bonds. And I'll have the second molecule right here, our is methyl. Now, one thing I didn't do here, but I will do on a test. If you were to have two answers, I would help you out. When I took organic chemistry, our instructor didn't, but I'll be nice. Don't tell anybody I'm being nice. And on a test, when you will get two products, I'll have two question marks. Now, if there's nothing there, that usually means one, unless I made a mistake, which I try not to. All right, let's continue on. Now here, if you notice, we took a hemiacetal or hemiketal and reacted with acid and water. Well, guess what? 
We can do that with an acetal or ketal. And if I have this molecule, which we learned earlier today, how to make, and this is a key molecule of our starches, which I'll come back to later in the semester. If I react it with water and acid, where do you find that? In your stomach. And what happens was, again, look at this molecule. This is the only other place in all of organic chemistry which has two oxygens to the same carbon. The only place. And now, what's attached to that carbon in terms of hydrogen carbons, our prime or H, our double prime, is still attached. And I don't know why my, ah, there we go. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> This happens once in a while. I try something and I'm not sure why I did this, but I know how to get out of it. All right, I got that fixed. Sorry about that. Got so many things to open up on my computer. That once in a while, it burps on me and it just burped on both of us. All right, let's go back to where we were. And I call this reversing. You could also call it acid hydrolysis of an acetal or ketal. And again, I have what's different. And this is the only other time in all of organic chemistry where you have two oxygens to the same carbon. On there, you can have R prime or H. When it's H, it's an acetal. When it's carbons to ketal, our double prime is carbons. Ours are carbons also. And I react it with water and acid, and what do you get? What's attached to the carbon with the two oxygens becomes a carbonyl, and the R prime or hydrogen, our double prime are still there, and then you get the alcohol. And you get two molecules if you're balancing it, but I'm gonna do this. And the reason I put this up here is on a test, I will ask you, give the organic product or products. So all you have to do is write down the aldehyde or ketone plus this alcohol. You don't have to put a two in front. If you want to, you can. If you notice, this gives the same products as this one, except that if you want, you can put the two in there, but you don't have to. Remember, organic chemists are lazy. I haven't asked you in a long time. So I ask now, thumbs up people. Can you see my whiteboard? Thank you. 
And if I take this molecule and react it with acid and water, what do I get? Well, I'm going to look here. What's different? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Oh, one, no, two oxygens, the same carbon. And on each one, I have carbons. And also on the same carbon with the two oxygens, I have R prime, which could be hydrogen, which it is in this case. I have carbons here, which I'll call R double prime. And from the oxygens, I'll call those R. And when I react this with acid and water, and this is the way your stomach actually breaks down complex carbohydrates, otherwise known as starches, I'll get back what's attached to the carbon with the two oxygens. It's now double bond to oxygen aldehyde or ketone, R prime could be H, R double prime. And then this R group on the oxygen becomes an alcohol. And if you want, you can put a two in front of there. Dr. White doesn't like to because we're lazy organic chemists. So if I look up here, I can say carbon that was the carbon with the two oxygens, which is this carbon, now is carbonyl, What's attached to that? Our prime, in this case, is a hydrogen. Our double prime, methyl. And then my R groups are here. And the carbon with the oxygen will be the carbon with the hydroxyl group. And if I ask on a test, give the organic product or products, I'm done. Now, if you want to put a two there, because it helps you, go right ahead. If you don't, that's okay with me, too. Ooh, so many twos. I see someone's still copying this down, so I will be patient. All right, remember if I go too quickly, you can always ask for me to roll back or watch it on the video or come to my office hours. And it's your turn to have some fun. What would be the or? Organic product or products of the following reaction. And on test, I would do this. Tell you there's two things. Have fun.
All right. Is this a thumbs up time for a check? I'll do thumbs up. Those of you out, webcams, I think everybody's just about done. Let's do it. Now, what do you do? And I'm going to sound like a broken record. If you ever heard a broken record, it, it keeps on repeating itself. I just did a generation gap thing on you people, most of you. Well, let me ask. How many of you still have your 33 and a half or third uh, records to play? How many of you? All right. So I actually went out and got one of the CDs came out. All my favorite Jimi Hendrix and everything else in CDs, Moody Blues. All right, let's do this. Look for what's different. What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? What's not a carbon carbon single bond? Oxygen. Oxygen. Ooh, two of them to the same carbon. That's rare. This is, and the previous one is the only example. And each carbon, oxygen, they're carbons, which I'll call R. Then on this carbon, there's a hydrogen, which could have been carbons too, R prime. Then you also have R double prime. And when you react this with water and acid, remember you find that in your stomach, you get back, keep your eye on the carbon that has the two oxygens. It's gonna be double bonded to a carbon oxygen Carbonyl is formed. What's attached to it in terms of hydrogen or carbon is still attached to it. So you get the ketone you would have used to make that compound. Plus the R groups on the oxygen become an alcohol. And for those who must, which is why I write it almost invisible, you could put a two there, but I won't. So if I look here, I'm gonna say this carbon becomes this carbon, what's attached to it. And first of all, I'm going to make some room for myself. And we have what's attached to it double bond, hydrogen, two carbons. And the second compound we have is this alcohol, which the R group comes from that, and that's methyl. So it's methanol. And if you wanted to put a two there, you had, you can. I put the quotes there, say, Dr. White wouldn't put that there, but if you want to, that's fine. And that's how you have it. And if you reacted this and this together, with an acid alone, ketone aldehyde alcohol acid, you would have made this, in this case, acetal. And that's how you do it. All right, now, like I said, the four reactions I just covered are some of the most challenging we'll do this semester. Students have initially trouble with it. I have in my practice problems, lots of work for help, examples for you to do and keep up with it. Like I said, Monday we'll do the alcohols and epoxides problem set. Now, if I look at the clock, it's time for a break. I went a little longer today because I wanted to catch up. By the way, later in the semester, I'll be talking about catch up. And yes, I can get into a lot of good stuff in this uh, course. Hot dogs, ketchup, potato chips. We already did the vodka and wine and beer. And we'll get into good stuff. Let's take a five minute break. I'll see you at 255. We'll go over to the lab and I'll get you out quick. And with that, I'll be back in five.
All right, hello. So, let's keep the alcohols. And then we must introduce some heat. So here I have What's up, everyone, and welcome to Labs with Lamp. All right, just have to find something real quick. Sorry about the delay. Oh no, I'm a whole minute or so late. Bad Dr. White. All right, let's do today's lab. Remember the lab you did last week is to be uploaded today or even tomorrow morning. Uh, make sure you get it in so I can grade it. I'm up to date. If you haven't, let me know. I know some of you have problems with work and everything because of COVID-19, I try and be understanding. All right, today's lab deals with alcohols. And alcohols are not just a good thing found in hard spirits or beer or wine. It's molecules that have a hydroxyl group, OH, on carbon. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a number of our labs, if we were doing face-to-face, -face, now we're doing it online, deals with some of the most fundamental properties of different functional groups. And let's look at the lab today. And today's lab, thumbs up people, did you see the lab on your screen? Thank you. Deals with alcohols. And I remind you, if we're in a lab, never light Bunsen burners, which we never do in organic, and make sure you properly dispose of each experiment's waste in the waste bottle in the fume hood if we are at ECC. Now, the first thing I like to talk about is the solubility of alcohols. In other words, when you mix it with water, is it soluble or not? Now, one of the important things about alcohols are the fact it can hydrogen bond. And if you have an alcohol, remember this is slightly or negative, this is slightly positive. And if you have water, which is the same thing, this is slightly negative, positive, because the electronegativity of oxygen, hydrogen difference, you can form a weak bond, which we call a hydrogen bond. It's not a true chemical bond, but it's a very important force. Now, this helps in water solubility, but 
a counter force is our carbon and hydrogen, which don't hydrogen bond. So does that play a role? If R gets bigger, more carbon and hydrogens, will that affect the hydrogen bonding and the water solubility? Guess what? I'm not going to give it away. And so what you would be doing in the lab is in a series of test tubes with DI water, DI is shorthand for deionized. We have filters, special cartridges that we pass what in industry we call city water through to take out most of the ions that would affect some of our experiments. And we call that DI water, deionized water. And you fill a small test tube, about a third. Then you add about five to 10 drops of the alcohol. And then you mix it. Now, we have both uh, vibrator mixers, or so you get to learn how to do this. Let's assume this was a test tube. It's not, but assume it was. How would you mix it without a vibro mixer? You hold it in one hand, take the other hand, go one, two, three, four, and that will mix it. Never ever mix a test tube like this because you'll get chemicals on yourself possibly if you don't stop it properly, or you can get chemicals on your neighbor. That's not good either. Now, remember, if you don't have a vibro mixer, those are the little plates you push it on, it goes like that, and they're really cool and fun to play with, but if you have one at home, use yours. But if you don't, you would take a test tube and go one, two, three. And I tell the class, if you're doing this method, don't tickle it because that won't make it mix. You really got to hit it hard. And you would do that. And I would tell you afterward, you'd wait a while. And if you see it's homogeneous, the same throughout, you'd say it's soluble. If you saw two layers, it's insoluble. And that's what we're doing in this reaction or this part of the uh, lab. Unfortunately, we I can't do this, uh, or you can't do it at home. So I gave you the data. Now, one thing I tell my students, I ask you to do right here for this table, draw the structures. One of these decades, I'll remember to write it on here. Underneath here for each of these molecules. And that will help you understand the relationship of the various things and whether it's soluble or insoluble. All right, that's part one. Now, part two, because if we were in ECC, unfortunately we're not, but I wish we were, I'd give you a chance to actually handle chemicals you probably wouldn't handle the rest of your life. And one of the things that an important physical property is, how does it smell? And you smell it and put down what your observations were. And throughout the semester, some of the labs, I'd have you smell things properly. Notice you just don't, uh, if it's on a piece of paper, it's dilute so you can go like this. But if it's in a bottle, always go like this or you could be uh, severely injured. So anyways, I'd have you smell it. And one of the things I would tell the class is how people interpret smells. It's one of the most complex things around. And because each of you have different life experiences, you'll smell something and think of it differently than I would or your neighbor. In fact, I'll teach you later and I'll talk about it later in the semester. One of the most difficult problems I ever had to face and ch challenge to solve dealt with odor of a compound. And that solution, $60 million a year was riding on it that I could solve it. 
And boy, I was getting calls from the CEO of that company when I got there, lunchtime before I left. Did you solve it yet? Because that much money was riding on a lot. Yes, I solved it, but you'll have to wait until later for me to tell you how I did it. So each of you have different interpretations of odors. And here you put a little of each compound on the piece of paper that we have cut up in squares and smell it. And I happen to put down what I students in the past have put down what they think it smells like. All right. Now the last one, uh, the second to last part, we're going to talk about oxidation of alcohols. Ah, potassium dichromate. And here I'll be using potassium dichromate. And what are we doing? Let me show you. If R prime is H, it's a primary alcohol. If R prime is carbons, it's a secondary alcohol. I always get this wrong, but I'll look it up. You have sodium dichromate solution, which you learned as oxidizing, you'll make a ketone or aldehyde. Now, for this reaction, this is a classic reaction. Usually, you add a little acid catalyst. You have a mixture. It's called acidic sodium dichromate. And here, what happens is, yes, you get the oxidation of the alcohol to make either an aldehyde or ketone. Plus, when something is oxidized, something else is reduced. And the sodium dichromate, which is an orange color, is reduced to plus three chromium salts, which is a blue green color. And so this is a classic test for primary and secondary alcohols. Why is that? And that's because if you have a tertiary alcohol, and you react it with sodium dichromate and the CR2. And acid, you have an acid solution. You get no reaction. If I could spell it right. I tell you I was the first one down in the spelling bee. I'd still be the first one down in spelling bee. And that means if you have an alcohol and you want to find out, is it primary, secondary, or tertiary, if you add sodium dichromate solution, which is orange and stays orange, you got a tertiary. If it changes color to a blue green, then it becomes, you know, you have a secondary tertiary alcohol. And I think Dr. White made a mistake when I put in the data on this lab. Yep. These, I was thinking of another oxidizing. I'm going to change this. This should be. And I'll go back and redo this and post it again. Sorry about that. 
I was thinking of another. So I'll be reposting this. If you actually did it in the lab, you would see this result for these alcohols be blue, green, blue, green. For this alcohol be orange and these would be blue, green. So you'll find later I ask, you know, what type of alcohol or I'll ask questions about this. All right. Now the last part, which I do as a demonstration in the lab, because sodium metal, I don't trust students to work with alone. I do trust myself. And that's the reaction of alcohols with sodium metal. Now, if we have an alcohol and you react it with sodium metal, this is one of the few times I'll balance an equation. Organic chemists usually don't. You'll form what's known as an alkoxide. In this case, the sodium alkoxide plus you'll make hydrogen gas and the arrow tells you this is a gas. And as you learn for the Williamson ether synthesis, sodium alkoxides are one of the intermediates reacted to make an ether. So to make this is an interesting thing. Now alkoxides also have another thing. They're one of the strongest bases in chemistry. And how do you make it? Alcohol plus sodium metal. Now, how do you know something's an acid or a strong base? I hope you all remember pH. pH is a measure of how acidic or basic it is. And the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. In the middle is 7. Now at 7, you have a neutral solution or a neutral pH. It's neutral. Above 7, it's basic. Below 7, it's acidic. And this you should have had in general chemistry. But quick review. So if I'm telling you this is a strong base or this is not, well, if I react this with this together and measure the pH of my product, and I also see bubbles, I know I've made this. And what I do in the class, in the lecture, or not in the lecture, in the lab, I wouldn't know, take sodium into a lecture room, is I take and I take some water and alcohol, and the alcohol I use would be, let me write it here, I didn't write it. And this is not rubbing alcohol, it's 100% isopropyl or 2-propanol and water and measure the pH and it's around neutral. Then I take the reaction of <clears throat> alcohol and sodium and you'll see when I do it in a test tube, you'll see bubbles coming up quite fast. And afterward, I measure with pH paper, which I think many of you are familiar with. I get a pH of about 13 or 12. And from that, you'll have to interpret, did this reaction really go? Let me do one thing real quick.
And here they put in sodium into different alcohols. And there he's putting the sodium in. I don't do the balloon, I just show it to you and I do the pH. And I'll hold up the test tube, which I use a bigger piece of sodium. And look, the balloon's growing. And that toe shows you you're making a gas. Uh, there's a slight difference in reactivities between primary and secondary alcohols, but even secondary alcohols like isopropyl go pretty quick. And for the lab, there's some questions at the end you should answer. And that's today's alcohol lab. And with that, let me remind you, don't forget on Monday we'll do the ethers and epoxides problem set. Also tonight, I will have my office hour in 15 minutes. That's at 6 p.m. on Zoom. You have the link in your syllabus, also the front page of Chem 170 and D2L. And with that, I'm going to say I'll see you on Monday. Gain Gazun. Bye. Dr. White. And if you have questions, I'll stick around. So, Dr. Ask, go ahead.